Hi, this is Tulio Sergusa with Dojo Live. I am here again at GBTA 2019 with another guest. This time I have Mike Cameron, who's the president of... Uh, Christofferson Business Travel. Christofferson Business Travel. I'm looking forward to talking with you today. Thank you for being my guest. Can you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself, uh, your history, how you got here? Yes, thank you, Tulio. Uh, Mike Cameron, CEO of Christofferson Business Travel, as, as we said. Uh, we uh, are a company that started in 1953. Uh, it was a husband and wife uh, company that owned it, Marilyn Lucille Christofferson. Uh, my wife and I bought the company in 1990, so the company had been in business for a long time before we bought it, but we've now owned it for 29 years. It was a very small company when we bought it, and uh, we have built the company to where we're now. Uh, we now have uh, six brands, we're in five states, we booked uh, about $680 million worth of travel last year, and uh, we have about 480 team members. So wow. we've, had a, we've had a good ride for the last 29 years. This is a family-owned business. Family-owned business. Husband my and wife, wife. My wife and I own the business. Okay, we have to definitely talk about, a little bit about that. <laughs> uh, people are probably very curious about that journey. Tell us a little bit about your company. What's the value proposition? Why does it exist? And, and, and really, what gave birth to this idea? Sure. So a couple things. We... Uh, when we purchased the company, uh, the first thing that we did was we changed the name to Christofferson Business Travel. We decided that we would uh, try to be very good at one thing and do one thing better than everyone else, and we focused on that vertical. It's been a very good thing for us. Uh, we also, at the same time, or, or rather later on, we uh, made the decision to develop a tech division. And in 2005, we started a technology division in our company. Uh, and started to build a technology platform which we call Air Portal. Uh, it's a very robust pet platform. We are connected to uh, uh, four GDSs, uh, WorldSpan, Apollo, Sabre, and Amadeus. Uh, we decided when we built the platform to focus on the travel manager. Uh, we knew at the time that most of our competitors, as the uh, internet was coming of age and mobile apps and mobile, well, mobile apps didn't exist then, but when uh, the internet was coming of age and technology was starting to drive the innovation behind the travel space. Uh, we noticed that most people were spending their time on the traveling, which makes sense, you know, the world warriors, the people that are actually out there doing it. Uh, we made the strategic decision to focus on the travel manager. So all of the tools that we have built up to this point have had that focus of the travel manager, helping them manage their portfolio of travelers. Uh, for risk management and data management and all the things that they're responsible for the cost management and savings uh, We focus on that. We built the first mobile app for travel managers uh, Air Portal 360 mobile which focuses on that market. So your focus is purely the corporate buyer the corporate client. Correct. I think a lot of people sometimes fail to realize in a day and age where uh, technology is so uh, agile and everyone's got apps and doing their own travel, that if you work for a large corporation, especially public corporation, there are compliance requirements and security requirements and uh, you know you have hundreds of thousands of employees, a lot of travelers, and there's people behind the scenes booking this travel. Yeah. So tell us what makes you unique uh, in offering that value to those corporate travel uh, managers versus uh, some other offerings that are out there, perhaps. Yes, thank you. Uh, good question. So we talk about we talk about the 98 uh, two percent uh, factor. 98 percent of our clients, and by the way, uh, we very much understand how important the travelers are, and we uh, focus a lot of our internal services around the customer experience for the traveler. But the travelers are 98 percent of the client pool, and the travel managers, the finance people, the procurement people. Uh, all of the people that are the travel planners, all the people that are behind the scenes coordinating and managing the travel for the corporation, they're only 2%. So it's very easy for any travel management company to think, well, I need to focus on the 98 because that's where all the action's taking place. Because of that, the 2%, the travel managers and the finance people, the procurement people, they get left behind. So we have really focused on that. We do, you know, we have a, we have a product called Security Logic, which, uh, keeps in, in, in live time uh, for a risk management uh, perspective, uh, tells all of the uh, people who are managing the travel where all their travelers are in the world in real time, and if there's anything bad happening in the world in the vicinities where their travelers are. We match up those events 
with the travelers, and if there is something bad happening, then we notify the travel manager, the traveler. We tell everybody that there's something happening that you need to be aware of. And we give them the option for the travelers to check in and do a safety check uh, using our technology to make sure that they're safe and, and protected. We have, a, we have a lot of analytical tools that we've developed for all of the accounting and finance people to be able to understand uh, travel spend. Uh, we actually have a, a third party a partner that we use for all of the data analytics, a company called Domo. I know Domo very well. <laughs> Happens to have the same, uh, very similar name to the to the, comp uh, to the name of your company, uh, but uh, the company that we partner with is Domo. We were we were the first company in the travel industry to partner with Domo uh, two years ago at this very conference at GBTA. We launched the Domo Christofferson Business Travel uh, Data Analytics Partnership, and it's been uh, become a robust partnership. Uh, we also find that a big reason that travel managers, accounting people, and travelers need to have connectivity to their data is simply for research. And uh, so we, we, we call our itinerary, our itinerary. it's the branded version of the traveler's uh, travel plans, and we have a whole suite of products that are set up to help people who need to get to the travel data do what we call itinerary lookups, to find the data that they're looking for specifically for a traveler or a trip or a group of travelers. A lot of times it's to, to do account uh, uh, or credit card uh, reconciliations, things like that, but they need the data and they have access to it easily and we facilitate that. So I want to shift gear a little bit to talk about your journey. Um, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that the one of the largest growing sector of technology is travel, the travel technology sector. And there are a lot of companies, much like yourself, who started many years ago with traditional agency type model and have had to either evolve or in some cases have disappeared because of what's happened. Tell us a little bit, what was that like for you going through that transformation? What, what was the moment where you're like, wow, we have to embrace this and, and any challenges you faced along the way? People are always interested in learning, how did you overcome those challenges? Tell us a little bit about that journey. If you will. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where the process started. Uh, we were, uh, in, in 2005, uh, we were in the middle of this whole online booking tool revolution where uh, our travelers were starting to book more travel online in addition to using our travel advisors to book their travel. And I realized that we had, um, the, the travelers and the travel managers had access to their data in a segmented way. So if they booked, if they booked the trip through the online booking tools that we were using, and we were representing uh, a couple of them back then. Uh, they had a, they could go into the online booking tool app to see their data, but if they needed to look at a trip that was with one of our booked by one of our travel advisors, they had to come to our travel agency and say, "Could you give me a copy of this trip?" And, and the, the moment when the green light went off in my mind was um, I was doing some business with my bank online one day and it occurred to me that I could see all my banking transactions in one place. I could log on and see uh, transactions where that I had done through the mail. I could see transactions that I'd done at the drive-up window. I could see transactions that I'd done digitally with, with uh, you know, different people that I do business with. I could see transactions that I di did with a teller inside the bank. I could see them all in one place. And so that gave me the idea for airport. Why is it that the travel industry hasn't developed a portal that's accessible to travelers, travel arrangers, travel managers, all permission-based, that gives all of them the ability to see all the data in whatever they want to see it, whenever they want to see it, however they want to see it, in one place. And that was the moment that I decided to launch airport. So we hired uh, a developer and we started to build a product. And we actually got the name uh, protected by the uh, patent, U.S. Patent and Exchange, uh, uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, rather, uh, back in uh, August of 2005, and started to build the platform, and it's uh, grown now. We've got a large, robust uh, software uh, development uh, team now that uh, builds all of these tools for us, and we've got a huge roadmap of things that we want to build in the future. Great. How do you go about validating new feature and functionalities or, and also integrating partners? How do you get access to the inventory? Do you, do you get that directly or do you work through third-party integration? Tell us a little bit about how the platform works 
on the back end? So on the back end, we because of the, because we have uh, four GDSs that we work with, um, we decided that we would take all of the information from all four GDSs, Worldspan, Apollo, Sabre, and Amadeus, and normalize all of that data into a data warehouse, into a, in, into, a, into a system that would allow our platform to work with this data warehouse in in one instance. And so we work, we, we, we normalize the data through the APIs of those four GDSs before we interface with all of the things that we're doing in our own in our own system. In terms of non-GDS data that we are now integrating into our platform, we at this point are still relying upon the our four GDS partners to bring that non-GDS data NDC-like data and other sources of data into their platform, and then we bring it from their platform through ours. We're still very dedicated to the GDS model, and we still believe that even in this NDC world, that the GDS is going to need to be the aggregator of all the data for us for, for the foreseeable future. So we're, we're all in with the GDS at this point. Well, it sounds like a lot of lessons from banking. That's kind of a banking to two with clearing houses and such. They uh, a lot of exactly. transferable things that they they have led the way with. Exactly. Um, tell me a little bit about what what was it like building a company with your spouse? You know, as a family business. Uh, you know, any the good, the ugly. What are some of the things that you've experienced along the way that maybe someone thinking good. about it is sort it's of all like good. it's all good. <laughs> Um, you know, we have a number of family members in our in our business now uh, as well. So, uh, you know, uh, a couple of our children work in the business. Uh, I have a brother that works in the business, a nephew. You know, so it's gone beyond just just a husband and wife uh, uh, arrangement. But I will tell you that I still think there is power in a privately owned, family owned business. And you know, some of the challenges. Uh, I mean, one of the challenges is that we're 100 percent self funded. So as a rapidly growing company that grew from 1 million to 680 million in a 25 year period uh, and do it without any outside funding, that is one of the challenges. Uh, it actually, you know, it actually, the, the husband-wife combo thing that worked great. Uh, in the early days, you know, we had a very small company with a small number of employees and we would, uh, I, I was the, uh, you know, the front uh, end of the business, uh, you know, with the, with the clients and with technology and with the sales and all of that and my wife was uh, doing some back-end stuff you know payroll and accounts payable in today's environment we have a you know a team of uh, you know 20 people that uh, handle finance and accounting and uh, you know you know with a uh, vice president of finance that runs it and so uh, my wife now is really the heart and soul of the business we have uh, we have a lot of company events uh, we had a great client event last night with some of our uh, most important clients that are here at GBGA, and uh, she, you know, she heads up that event. We were, you know, in terms of uh, uh, our oldest daughter works with her. They kind of work uh, in a partnership way. Uh, Camille and Jenica, my wife Camille, our oldest daughter Jenica, and uh, they really uh, handle all the customer events. We still celebrate birthdays for our employees. We have, uh, we, we fly around to our various offices and have birthday events to recognize them, recognize their birthdays. And, and uh, do a lot of personalized things that can only be done with a husband and wife and a family-owned business. And it's very important to us. We have we have two we have two core values uh, in our company, and that is to value people and to create value. Uh, my wife uh, Camille is the heart and soul of the company. She really focuses on making sure that we are valuing our people and taking care of them, and including them in our family. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm more responsible for the value creation side of the business. You know, I'm more involved with the strategy and with making sure that we're always doing things that uh, create value. And if you put those things together, one's a little more internally focused, valuing people. One's a little more externally focused, creating value through building technology and unique competitive advantages. And you put those two together, uh, it's magical. We have very low employee turnover. Uh, we hired about 60 people last year. Uh, we, my wife and I personally, uh, went to lunch with every new hire on either the first or second day that they came to work for us. We fly them into our, our corporate headquarters in Salt Lake City and we take them to lunch personally with just the two of us. So it's 
a it's a it's a it's a really good uh, way to run a business. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned, even if you don't run a family business from this model. I, uh, you know, the sponsor of the show, Dojo Live Nearsoft, is is very much a people centric, people first business, and the model has always been take care of people first, the rest will come, and and it definitely works. There's actually been studies that show. Uh, that those companies who operate that way, that are very people-centric, that are about empowering uh, their employees, outperform the S&P by like a factor of 7x. So congratulations on that. If you had to touch a little bit more about the culture, what would you encourage companies that are not family-run, what, what are some of the principles that they could adopt? We've heard you about you know, taking the employees to lunch, you know, and celebrating their, their birthdays. birthdays. What are some of the other things that are working really well, perhaps, uh, you know, borrowing from the initiatives that your wife has put in place in terms of being, I guess, the, the chief heart officer of the company? Uh, what are some of the things that you would suggest companies that are not family-owned that they can implement right away that would give tremendous benefit to the employees and to them, to the business in terms of improving morale and engagement? Well, for one thing, uh, for one thing, and any CEO can do this, you don't have to be a family-owned company to do this. But really, have an open door. Uh, we we you know we make sure that uh, anybody can come and talk to us anytime about anything, and I think that uh, that is important. We also when we ask ourselves whenever we are making a decision that will affect our employees, we ask ourselves, does this really validate that we value our people? Does this is this really uh, does this seriously value that uh, value that uh, you know, core value that we have? I'll give you an example. Uh, in the 2008-2009 recession, uh, when the whole travel economy collapsed, we lost about 20% of our, of our volume overnight in, in one quarter. And it took a good part of the year to, to rebuild that, a uh, good part of the next year. We only had one layoff during that entire time. We did everything humanly possible to not have to let anybody go during that economic downturn. One person that we let go happened to be dedicated uh, to a client for a specific purpose that discontinued that function that, that, that he was handling, and then we ended up, uh, and so we didn't have any work for him, and then we ended up hiring him back uh, at, at a later date, and he still works for us today. Uh, so I think it's those kinds of things that really validate, do they really value their people, or do they just say they value people? And uh, we really do. We care a lot about our people. We consider them to be family. In a service industry, people are everything. Everyone says that, you know, it's an easy cliche thing to say, but you have to make sure that you're living that every day. I think that's wonderful, and certainly the low attrition rate is always the proof of the pudding. <laughs> you can say whatever you want, but it would, you know, if people stay, that's really the proof the, there. So, here at GBTA 2019 in Chicago, anything new you're announcing? What are some of the things you're looking to accomplish uh, from this event? Well, one of the things that we're doing, we have all sorts of uh, technology initiatives that we are working on and that we're, and that we're you know, doing right now. One of the things that we've done is that we have divided our uh, technology platform into three product groups. And so we've always focused on the travel manager uh, we have done some focus on the traveler, and then we've done some focus on the, those users of, of data and reporting and finance needs. So we've split our, instead of having one product manager that oversees all three, we've split our product team into three product teams. One that focuses on the travel traveler and travel advisor, one that focuses on the account manager and travel manager, so the account manager for our company, the travel managers for the companies that we serve, and the third that focuses on just all of the data and reporting needs for all of our uh, constituents, whether they be internal or external. Uh, we've, we've, we've done that, and I think we're getting a, a better focus on all three product groups, with our primary focus still being the travel manager, uh, where it's always done. The other thing that we're doing is in, in addition to focusing so much on the technological and the digital experience that we're building for our uh, our constituents. We're also doing a renewed focus on just being customer-centric on the full-service side. So we've got all sorts of initiatives to 
uh, train our people and to empower them to provide a, and some of it's even technology, technological empowerment to help them uh, personalize the experience. But we're doing all kinds of things to really come back to our roots, which is customer service. So we're being, uh, we're, we're making sure that in the process of implementing all of this new technology that we don't lose sight of customer centricity. Uh, we've got three focuses right right now on customer centricity and that is a digital focus, a consultative focus, and a personalized focus. And we are making certain that we are meeting the needs of all three focuses from a customer centric point of view. We're doing a lot more engagement with our with our customers and with our end users to make sure that those things that we're building are working for them, meeting their needs, and uh, helping uh, them feel valued by us and helping create value for them. So just sort of coming back to our old roots of, of, of good old-fashioned customer-centric customer service in addition to the digital experience, which are both are equally important. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always curious to learn the values of the founders and the, the, the CEO of a company that drives the branding vision, right? I, I always believe that there's always some values that you hold on to that's prompting you to do what you do and how you do it, especially when it comes to culture. Can you share some of your own personal values that have been infused in how you well, build up this amazing company and business? Well, I, I, I think I sort of did that, but uh, yeah, I, 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 yes, um, the answer is yes. Uh, and it really is those two things that I talked about, value people and create value. We, we sat down um, a number, you know, a while back, we sat down with, um, our VP of HR and talent, and she wanted to really understand what made uh, my wife and I tick, and what made us create a company in the way that we did that became as successful as it did. Yeah, I'm interested in the why yeah, behind those the, two. And, and, those and, two and, yeah, and the why, the why was, it was, was really just those two things, just really sincerely valuing people and creating value. Those were the two things. I'll, I'll, I'll talk, um, on, the, on the value people side, I talked quite a bit about that already, but let me just tell you about you know, what, how, how, I, um, how I see creating value. In order to really create a unique competitive advantage, um, you have to do something that meets four criteria. You have to build a service or a product that is unique and competitive, that is objectively uh, competitive, that is quantifiably competitive, that is not a cliche, and that is not claimed by the competition. And that's a very tough lens to put those things that you're building to create value through. To make sure that it's that you're doing something that's objective, quantifiable, not a cliche, and not claimed by the competition eliminates a lot of the, you know, things like, well, we'll exceed your expectations. Well, you know, that's not very objective. Everybody says that. That's not very quantifiable. It's a cliche, and every every one of our competitors says it. So we try to avoid those sort of cliche things and really look at what can we do that will make us different better. And that has really driven the vision behind the airport platform, is that whole create value uh, vision. Uh, I think as an entrepreneur, you realize pretty quickly that uh, if you're not doing something, and, and it just has to be slightly incrementally better. It doesn't have to be don't have to change the world. You could, but you don't have to change the world to be that much better than your competition and to be able to grow faster than that. And it's not, it's honestly not that hard to make the changes that you need to make to, so that people sincerely know they're being valued and that you care about them and that they're, they're important to you and to really build things and do things that create value. It's not that hard. And those two things are important to me. It's the heart and soul side of our business, and it's the unique competitive advantage entrepreneurial side of our business. And those two things are what makes us tick. I think and those are important. amazing words of wisdom. I hope people have taken those in. It reminds me of a book I read by Jerry Bass. It was called Soft Selling in a Hard World, where he was talking about if it's not quantifiable, if it's not measurable, it's just puffing. <laughs> so thanks for joining us today. We're up on time. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. And a lot of luck here at the show, and thank you for, for being my guest. We're enjoying it. Thank you. You bet. Good luck to you, too. Thanks.